evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Director General of this museum, I welcome you to the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrahale. We are indeed happy to host today's special lecture by Dr. Gauri Parimu Krishnan. She's an independent curator, art historian, and museum consultant. She was the lead curator and inaugural director of the Indian Heritage Center, senior curator for South Asia, and deputy director of research and publications at the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore. She is a recipient of the Singapore government's Commendation Medal and Public Administration Medal for her contribution to the arts and heritage sector. She earned her PhD in art history from the MS University of Baroda and has been teaching art history and aesthetics at the Baroda Faculty of Fine Arts for years. Her lecture today on Fustat to Malacca, Indian trade textiles found in West Asia and Southeast Asia, will be reflecting on the maritime dialogue between people engaged in trade within Asia since pre-modern times. The talk will examine carbon-14 dated or inscribed examples that support the ethno-archaeological and historical methodologies in manufacture, exchange, and consumption of Indian trade textiles in Southeast Asia and West Asia. In her presentation, we will also have an opportunity to look at Indian trade textiles from international museums for their formats, patterns, motives, and functions in the countries and communities from Egypt to Indonesia where they were collected. So all in all, in for a great treat, a great visual treat. Before we begin, I will request our trustee, Dr. Devangana Desai, to felicitate our speaker for the evening, Dr. Gauri Prarimukrishnan. We are told Dr. Desai knows Dr. Gauri from when she was a real little child. So it was most appropriate to get her to felicitate you. I welcome you to give your lecture, and I'm sure you're happy to take questions in the end. So, yeah. This is really a very, very special moment for me uh, to be invited, and it was very uh, fortuitous that uh, Dr. Mukherjee and I were in a conference in Thailand together a few months ago and uh, we spoke and he happened to leave a day before my presentation. So this presentation is specially for you. Um, so for a room full of uh, people who are, uh, who range from uh, extremely knowledgeable collectors to people who may not know much about the Indian trade textiles. What I will try to do is to go into a little background and introduction on what are these trade textiles and why, why were they traded or, or what was the impetus. Uh, but the focus is really on the art historical relevance of this material and to see them in the longer or in, in the larger context of Indian art production uh, because they are considered usually as late or as crafts and they have not merited attention of Indian scholars for a very, very long time. So this is a case uh, trying to draw everyone's attention to their visual quality while, of course, uh, understanding it's a larger context in trade and exchange of uh, ideas in the global uh, Indian Ocean world. So, um, much of the material that uh, I have um, in this uh, presentation is from uh, the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Um, so, um, the, the reason why this presentation uh, and what's my connection with this, uh, i just give you a quick uh, overview in um, two minutes. So, uh, way back in 2009, uh, due to certain personal uh, uh, crisis in the life of a collector um, in US, R R Mr. Roger Hollander, a collection of beautiful textiles from Gujarat and Coromandel Coast, almost 300 of them came out on the market and this was a very, very rare opportunity for this material to actually appear on the market and it was a very comprehensive collection. And so this one fine day, uh, me and my, cu my curator colleague from the Southeast Asia Division 
uh, where faced with this fabulous, fabulous collection, of course, which came at a very high price, but we really did not have the, um, the, the, the heart to let it go. And it was a very uh, painful and a very long drawn uh, negotiation and also uh, um, uh, attempt to fundraise for the collection. However, it was uh, almost after about five months, we, we managed to put together uh, the, the funds and the necessary uh, legal uh, documentation to in, uh, in order for this collection to come to Singapore. And the reason for it, or the fight for it to come to Singapore was to make sure that it comes back to the region from where it was originally traded in the 17th and 18th centuries. So um, going back to the uh, quick overview on the significance of this material. So the 17th and the 18th centuries were marked by trading in luxury goods, which benefited not only the European economies, but also the Southeast Asians. Indian textile production and international trade along the Indian Ocean between the 18th and 19th centuries had faced many upheavals <clears throat> with, inter with irretrievable consequences in most cases um, the economic disturbance it brought about in uh, handmade textile trade uh, indicates that it was something that was irretrievable. But this research, in, and in this uh, context, when I tried to work on the material that was available to me, I tried to focus not so much on the reason for the uh, handmade industry to, um, to, to uh, diminish and disappear, which has been well uh, researched and documented, Whereas uh, instead of going into the economic aspects of it, I focused more on the uh, material culture of certain Indian Ocean uh, communities while remaining art historical in focus um, and while analyzing uh, the motifs, the compositions, and the evolution of some of these textiles that you will see very, very soon. So I'm going to move very quickly into uh, the research objectives uh, that this presentation uh, actually uh, covers. Um, most, of, most importantly and most uh, prominently, it is about the interconnectedness of the Indian Ocean communities, which we tend to uh, forget that even in 15th century, it was a very well-connected world. And the, the concept of globalization that we encounter now is not really uh, uh, anything new. It's just that it's become more digital. But in the past, also, many communities and many, many far-flung communities were actually uh, well connected through the trade network. Um, this research also focuses on the material culture of the Indian Ocean communities. Uh, and I, I, as I said, I would also be using, uh, since I have this uh, background in uh, architecture, sculpture, and the uh, study of the classical material, I will be bringing a lot of references from there into the uh, analysis of the motifs and the compositions of some of these textiles. So. I want to say this right at the outset, that my interest is not from the perspective of a textile scholar per se, but from uh, an art historian of uh, sculpture, architecture, and the visual culture of uh, Indian art. So I, I come from that background, and I'm looking at this material from that perspective. Um, this research also underscores the shift in patronage. Some of these textiles, as I, as I will elaborate when we look at the examples, were meant only for export. So they never made it to the local or domestic market. And some, like the patolas, were from the local market or the domestic market, and they were specially made with different dimensions, with different structure and motifs for a particular patron that was in Indonesia or, or the regions uh, beyond uh, the Indonesian island. I mean, not just in Java or Bali, where the royalty was coveting these textiles, but also through the, through the tribal uh, societies and communities throughout Southeast Asia. So there is uh, this whole uh, con context of patronage and transition uh, that happens in these, some of these textiles. And with the help of uh, some examples from Gujarat and Coromandel Coast, I'll be elaborating uh, some of these details. Uh, the objective uh, here is also to draw attention to the mobility and circulation of textiles uh, through merchant communities as well as uh, through the class and kinship relationships that existed in some of these Indonesian tribal societies. 
And it is also something very unfathomable right now, sitting here in 21st century in a metropolis like this, uh, how uh, things like um, cloves or uh, things like um, uh, mace, nutmeg, you know, pepper, these objects of uh, uh, culinary uh, requirements actually led to this huge movement of textiles from one continent to another. And people were actually willing to explore and uh, people are willing to risk their lives uh, to obtain these, um, uh, the spices in exchange for the textile trade. I'm going to move faster because I have a lot of slides to show you. Um, uh, talking about the intra-Asian trade, um, the illustration right here, if, uh, if you are interested, is from, um, tombstone, which actually came from Cambay. And very interesting research has been done by Elizabeth Lamburn uh, in trying to analyze some of these, uh, tech, uh, some of these um, tombstones, which actually were produced in Cambay, and they moved to some of these sites along the Indian Ocean. And uh, so we have examples from Kilwa, Mogadishu, Aden, Dofar, uh, Trincomali, Pasai, and Gresik. Uh, so the, the whole range is uh, quite wide. And what is very interesting is to uh, notice that there is epigraphical information, there is uh, archeological information, and there is uh, stylistic information that comes into play in analyzing how, what was the role of some of these uh, objects that were religious in nature, but had very important economic connection. Uh, in that light, I also want to highlight the number of uh, communities, the business communities uh, that took part in this trade. And uh, some of them also had uh, relevance in the context of Mumbai and the trade that developed in um, when Mumbai became a very important port. And uh, recently, I'm also working on the, uh, on the uh, Gujarati community of traders in Singapore and Malaya and Malaysia. So there again, I have this whole context of um, Gujarati traders coming from Mumbai to set up an office in Singapore. So this is a, uh, in the, the trade networks in the Indian Ocean Rim have been in existence from between 13th and 15th century, way before the Portuguese come and discover this very well oiled system of uh, t uh, textile and spice trade. The key, the key players in this exchange were Gujarati traders, the Bohras, the Hindu, uh, Hindus from Kutch, Saurashtra, and Surat, the Kling merchants from, or uh, the Chitti, uh, or the Chulias from um, Tamil Nadu, which is the Coromandel Coast, and the Malabari Mapilas, who were also um, uh, involved in uh, trading in a very, very big way, and they were actually one of the uh, precursors of this trade before the Kling merchants or the Chitti and the Chudia entered this trade. Uh, there's also a very strong possibility that uh, some of the local traders also, uh, local ru ruling class in some of these uh, state uh, regions in Southeast Asia as well as in West Asia were involved in this trade. So looking at this tomb, um, which is uh, illustrated here, it is possible that either the tomb was entirely carved and put together in uh, Cambay and shipped along with uh, craftsmen, and it could have been used to uh, uh, create the tomb for uh, either a trader who came from uh, uh, the, any, any part of India, either West Asia, I mean Western part of India or Eastern part of India, or it could have been used or commissioned by a local convert, recent convert to Islam, uh, who could have uh, commissioned these uh, uh, tombstones from uh, Kembe to come to uh, Southeast Asia. So there are many interesting uh, connotations of this tomb uh, and the network of traders that existed. And here I want to, um, sorry. Pointer is, oh, okay. So you can see Kilwa and uh, Mogadishu and Aden, and then you see Kambe here, and uh, Trincomalee is uh, Sri Lanka, and you have Gresik, 
and uh, Samudra Pasai in Sumatra and uh, Indonesia. So this entire region, as, uh, uh, as um, Tome Pire mentions in his uh, Summa Oriental in the beginning of the 16th century, that India actually uh, you know, hugs both the West Asia or with one arm, uh, Aden, and the other arm up to Malacca. So you can see this whole network uh, that was uh, spread out from India being in the center. Um, then moving on to the uh, more uh, closer into the Red Sea area, and you have the collection of Fostad in this museum, which I'm very fortunate to uh, uh, illustrate in this presentation. So the Cairo material comes out, uh, the Fostad material comes out from Cairo. Here, Cairo, uh, Fostad is actually a um, suburb of Cairo, and most of the findings uh, of little scraps of textile come from uh, surface finds. They are not actually excavated pieces, but it, rep it represents a very important juncture in history because uh, the first time they were uh, discussed by Matibel Gittinger in the 70s and 80s, when they were not carbon dated and they were assumed to be from the 15th century, but with carbon dating done at the Oxford lab by Ruth Barnes and her colleagues, it's now come to uh, earlier dating of nearly 10th, 11th centuries. There's also Baranike and Kusar al-Khadim, which I have identified here, highlighted here. Uh, Kusar al-Khadim is the only site which is properly excavated using the stratification uh, te technique. So it's also another very important site. I will show you the images from uh, this, um, these sites in a few minutes. But this is just to situate the Red Sea material, uh, which is known now as the Indo-Egyptian textiles. Um, this is the region of Southeast Asia, and anywhere from uh, Sumatra to Oh, this is a little tricky. Okay, so anywhere from Sumatra, Malaysia, Penang onwards to all the islands of Indonesia, uh, um, Eastern Indonesia, which is uh, uh, Eastern Malaysia, Sabah, Sarawak, Borneo, uh, which is uh, Brunei now, and Sulawesi, which is called Celebes, and the Molukas Islands, you find Indian trade textiles all along these uh, little remote islands, and also up in Philippines, you see, uh, the patolas of Gujarat. So there is this theory, I will just say very quickly, that textiles would reach either uh, Malacca, uh, or um, this is Malacca, or Aceh. And uh, after the arrival of, of course, the Portuguese, the Gujarati traders had no choice. They had to abandon Malacca, so they made their focus uh, on uh, Sumatra instead, in Aceh, and uh, some of the ports on this side. and they what happened, what would typically happen is annually the ships will come uh, between uh, March and September and they will, they will be met by uh, traders uh, from these islands and they will exchange their goods for the textiles and they'll go back and these uh, Gujaratis and the Chulias will go back uh, with the eastern monsoon between November and February. So this was the well-oiled system, which has been very beautifully uh, documented in great length, at great length and in details by uh, Tume Pire, which um, again I will quickly uh, read. But before going into that, which is 15th century, I just wanted to highlight a very important trade network that existed from the Tamil uh, community, mainly from the Chulias and the Chittis. Um, and there is as early as 11th century Tamil inscription which has been studied by scholars like Noburu Karashima and Subarayalu, which records the presence of merchant guilds, trading guilds in uh, Java. And this is one of uh, the uh, inscriptions which reads about the rules and guidelines which are set up for the traders uh, that every trader had to uh, follow. And so this uh, Tamil inscription found in Java actually proves that some of the trading uh, networks existed as early as the 11th century. Uh, I will quickly show you these maps uh, highlighting the ports which range uh, on the Coromandel coast, which range anywhere from uh, um, Masulipatnam all the way to Kail uh, down in the uh, southern part of Tamil Nadu. 
And these are all important uh, ports that develop within a period of 200 years, 300 years, uh, that have uh, strong connections with trading networks in West Asia, um, sorry, in Western European countries, as well as in Southeast Asia. So first de uh, regions developed by the Dutch, then by the English. And uh, some of these hinterlands produced uh, not only cotton, but they were woven textiles and also painted and dyed textiles. So dye and cotton both came from the hinterland of uh, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, we'll, we'll look at them slightly later when we start looking at the textiles. I'm just giving you an overall uh, geographical um, uh, context first. Um, and these are some uh, quotations which I, again, will not be going into but it gives very, very clear idea of the movement of textiles, movement of traders, uh, the value of the traded goods, the frequency of the, uh, um, of the uh, ships that plied between these two regions, Polikat and Malacca, and the important ports, which I just uh, highlighted on the map, all listed here. Uh, so this was something that was documented by Tume Pire in the uh, beginning of the 16th century. Uh, we are mo moving towards uh, now Western India. This is a quick uh, survey of uh, textile productions in Gujarat, um, woven and uh, block printed. And much of the uh, focus is in this region of uh, Kambay and um, Surat. Uh, of course, the uh, hinterland of Gujarat also produced cotton and dyes, and also uh, some of the factories would be in this region. And of course, you have the patolas up there. Uh, and many of the trading communities came from the Kachi and the Saurashtra people, as well as the Surtis and the Bohra Muslims. I will talk about one such family uh, when we look at the textiles. Um, again, Suma Oriental has this reference about the Gujarati merchants found in Malacca. So when the Portuguese attacked uh, Malacca, they found that there were 1,000 uh, Gujarati traders in Malacca and about four to 5,000 which trans transient Gujarati traders. And there was also a Gujarati Shah Bandar, uh, meaning the head of the uh, trading community in the port who was overseeing the matters relating to the Gujarati traders. So, And the Gujaratis were so influential in their trade, they also were uh, so, so called advisors to the uh, to the, uh, uh, the sultans in uh, in Kambay. So this all falls through when the uh, Portuguese attack and the Gujaratis focus their attention on Aceh in Sumatra. Um, okay, moving on. I, I also wanted to uh, introduce a point about shipping, and this is just a quick snapshot of. Uh, a very important site in Gujarat. This is from Mandvi, and I must owe this to the research done by um, Dr. Uh, Lotika Varadrajan in this area. She not only researched on the ship builders, but she also worked very closely with the Malams, the, uh, the, the, the people who, the captains of the ship, and their traditional knowledge, and how they actually, um, what they experienced, and how they went on the sea. So this is an example of shipbuilding that is still currently going on in, um, in Kutch, in Mandvi. But of course, the wood doesn't come from, from India. It doesn't come from Gujarat. It comes from Malaysia. So it's a very interesting network still continuing uh, in the maritime history. And also, these are examples of uh, ethno-archaeology, where we can get a lot of information by just uh, looking at the technique of building boats, the, uh, the Kharwa community that is still going to the uh, sea uh, currently, and also the way um, navigation along the coast happened in those like this uh, all along the last 500, 700 years in Western India. This is a, um, a drawing, a Dutch drawing of Kambe. Uh, today, Kambe is a very sleepy town, but you can see uh, from this illustration, they had many religious architectures, so you can see the kind of community of trading uh, families or trading communities that settled in Kambay in the 17th century. Okay, now we come to the, uh, the interesting part, the visuals. Uh, this is a group of uh, examples. Again, 
as I said, the phosphate material is in, is in tatters. There are no large pieces like we get from Southeast Asia because they were kept as heirloom textiles. And usually in the Tonkanan in Indonesia, for example, they would be kept up where the cooking happens. So all the, uh, the, um, the vapors that uh, rise from the cooking, uh, that smoke that rises from the cooking would actually preserve the textiles and not allow any insects to grow. So unlike Southeast Asia, uh, the uh, condition of the West Asian textiles is quite poor. And many of them were found from rubbish dumps, ancient rubbish dumps. So many of these uh, excavations were actually done just as surface findings, and they found a lot of material uh, like this. And so um, my interest is, of course, in the interpretation of the, the scroll pattern or the elephant and the floral patterns that you find uh, from Baranike, from Kusar al Khadim, and from Fostat. And uh, looking closely at the uh, technique, um, I would like to highlight the fact that resist was used very early in textile production. So all the white parts or the white sections or the lines are actually drawn with resist. Um, and then uh, the red color comes from the red dye, which is alizarin based. And for it to be, uh, to, for it to fix on, uh, we need alum. So alum is the mordant. So this is mordant and resist dyeing. And uh, as you know from uh, a Gujarati, uh, uh, folklore, uh, the, the textiles made in Gujarat would tear but not fade. And this is a real example of that. Um, of course, that's not the case anymore. Uh, so looking at, of course, the antecedents of this kind of textile patterns, uh, the earliest example that can come to my mind is, of course, Ajanta. And we have a number of very realistic uh, um, adaptations or stylistic adaptations of these motifs um, in the trade textiles, even though they are done using uh, a pen or stylus, but they are also in, in a way precursor to the Kalamkari of today. Uh, this set is from the uh, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj uh, Vastu Sangralai from this museum. And again, I was very delighted to see the resist printing. Uh, some of these could could be block printed, as you can see, this is where the block ends, the two blocks. Uh, and some of them would have been hand drawn. And what is very interesting is the two colors, the, the maroon and the dark maroon. So you can see the range of colors that have been applied on using uh, alum uh, for, the, for the modern thing. And the blue is indigo, which would be applied on uh, either uh, through brush or by resisting the rest of the sections uh, and then uh, putting the textile in the indigo bark. Uh, but most likely this is applied on with, with brush. And there are also these very interesting Islamic inspired uh, patterns, which could have been uh, block printed most likely. So most of these textiles are therefore found in Gujarat, uh, found, manufactured in Gujarat and found in uh, the Fostad region. And uh, again, the antecedents for these kind of patterns, I turn to giant miniature painting. And we have beautiful examples of uh, scrolling vines, which uh, frame the borders of the manuscripts. And the arches, which I feel are not necessarily Islamic at this stage, could also be inspired from the Buddhist architecture that we find in um, Ajanta and Western India. And this particular example highlight for uh, Two things. One, I feel this could be ikat textile, ikat weaving, and not block printing. And this is, of course, uh, block printing with um, indigo dyeing. So I, I'm of the view that we should look at examples existing in um, Ajanta painting for antecedents of uh, ikat weaving, double ikat weaving in Western India, because Jalna is in Maharashtra from where. Uh, the Indian, uh, from where the Patan Patola families is supposed to hail. So this could be a possibility that Maharashtra already had um, uh, well-established uh, ikat uh, weaving very early, uh, much earlier than we think. And then that the, the weavers moved uh, into different regions. Some went to South India also. And apparently today also the South Indian weavers are supposed to have come from Saurashtra area or from North Gujarat area. So 
possibly the movement goes from Maharashtra to Gujarat and then to um, South India. But I mean, this is just a conjecture. Uh, now I have this very interesting uh, examples from uh, the collection of um, Ashmolean Museum. And on the side are two examples that come from the Roger Hollander collection of the ACM. Um, what is very interesting I found is the resist uh, painting of this very interesting tree motif that is very unique to Gujarat of the early period, which is also found in Fostat. And then you also find, so this is Fostat example from the Ashmolean collection. And these are from Toraja in Indonesia from the ACM collection. And you can see the variety and, and, and the stylistic evolution of this pattern. So this is um, mo most likely hand painted. This is also hand painted, whereas this is block printed. And within say a, sen a, a couple of centuries, the stylistic variation uh, is quite, quite evident. And here again, you see the use of uh, indigo becomes much more pronounced as, uh, as we progress. Uh, yet another example from Southeast Asia and from, uh, uh, from Egypt. So this is uh, from the Kelsey Museum. This fragment is from the Kelsey Museum in Michigan. And this is the Roger Hollander collection of uh, what we call the grape pattern uh, design acquired in Toraja. And again, you can see uh, almost within 600 years, the, uh, the evolution of the motif is nearly unchanged. And this is what I call the constancy of patterning, which, produce, which is produced year after year or generation after generation for centuries. And we, do, we kind of lose track of time that some of these patterns that we wear even today uh, actually hail from almost 500 years or 700 years before. Uh, more Fostad examples also from the Calico Museum. I found this picture on the internet. But you also see this very interesting tree of life motif and the uh, Golconda uh, um, uh, 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 curtain from the, uh, which is very similar to the example which also comes from the um, museums in, uh, in America, especially the Brooklyn Museum. So you have a whole range of textiles uh, in, in uh, Calico Museum that also cover the region from uh, West Asia to Europe and also to Southeast Asia. Um, more example of textile I found on um, in, in Indonesian sculpture. And this is again very important because uh, the examples that we are going to see uh, of um, Gujarati textiles in particular from East Java uh, very shortly. Uh, you also see sculptures from East Java representing on the sarong, for example, this very uh, popular motif uh, that is uh, very much prevalent in the um, aesthetic and the cultural ethos of Southeast Asia. Um, I will quickly move through this uh, uh, point about the research that we conducted. So once the collection came in 2009, I was fortunate enough to also head a research unit within the museum. So we hired uh, scholars to work for us uh, to do two types of uh, testing. One is the fi um, dye testing with fibers, which we sent to a lab in um, Japan. And another one was on the radiocarbon dating. So we took another set of fibers and we sent off to New Zealand to the rafters uh, lab to test on the um, the dating of some of these textiles. So the, the catalog that we have been all waiting for from the ACM's collection will have the results of this uh, published in the uh, catalog. And, and an essay written by some of the scholars who were involved in this research. So we are all waiting for this. But uh, just to give you a quick snapshot of what the curatorial team did uh, was to go and look at some of the uh, cultivation of indigo and indigo dyeing in Vilupuram and the Pondicherry. Uh, and this was a very important uh, discovery for us as to how textiles are actually produced, uh, or dyes are actually produced, and then from the dye, how the textile is, um, yarn is uh, uh, produced, and then after that, how the textiles are woven or painted. So this was another discovery in Sri Kalahasti. 
So uh, this is one of the families of Kalamkari painters who were um, identified by Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay in early 50s for the revival of the uh, Kalamkari at Sri Kalahasti. So this um, Mr. Srinivas actually comes from that family and how they have again gone back to using the, um, the, the natural dye for uh, the use of, uh, for the production of Kalamkari textiles. Uh, this is the Patan Patola makers whom I have been uh, documenting for many, many years and who I have visited over uh, almost 20 years now. This is uh, the family of Vinayak Salvi who traced their history to almost 700 years to uh, Solanki period. And uh, this is a very interesting family which has preserved uh, the use of natural dyes. Of course, they do other commercial work, but they still continue the knowledge of using natural dye. Single ikat, double ikat uh, weaving in Rajkot. And uh, this is the visit to uh, block makers in Petapur. Uh, I won't be able to go into the details of um, all the different types of textiles, but they are very important in the Bohra trading of the Muscati textiles or the textiles produced uh, in Ahmedabad and traded to Thailand by a Bora family called the Maskati family. And uh, this is Mr. Uh, Manik, Manik Lal and his brother Damodar Gajar. Both of them are no more, but we managed to document uh, him on, on film, in video, about his entire experience and his life's work, and also documented the pat pattern books. And some of these patterns have been actually revived. So here in the... Uh, Tumpal, or the border of the textile, this is a block, uh, I mean, a print of the block. You will see in Thai, uh, Thai um, uh, script, the word Maskati is written. So this family was producing these textiles uh, with the carving of the blocks done by the uh, Gajar families in Pithapur. And they were so popular that they actually also put their own name into the textile pattern. And a scholar from uh, Thailand has actually revived this material and she is getting them, uh, so she's actually reproducing the blocks based on these uh, pattern books and also uh, printing the textiles. I, will, I won't be able to go into Thai materials, so the focus will be very much on Indonesia. And of course, as part of our research, we have traveled to many private museums and museums and also uh, government museums. So uh, Jagdish and Kamla Mittal also has this very beautiful piece from Baranpur, which is also in Maharashtra, a very important site. Kodali Karpur, which has almost completely died, uh, and it is now being revived, but I don't know with how much success. This is a Sri Lankan market textile. And uh, these are blocks for uh, uh, imitation patolas, which were found in Koromandal Coast. So I will talk about this uh, very quickly when we come to see the uh, textile patterns. This is a collection from the uh, uh, Saraswati Mahal library. The only point I want to make here is textiles are also used for bookbinding. And these are mushroom and uh, block printed textile examples which were used for bookbinding. Moving into the structure of the textile. So what I want to highlight is that many of these textiles were used as heirlooms and preserved. So some of them were worn for one generation, but once the ancestors passed on, the textile became heirloom collections. So many of them were kept uh, for, sorry, many of them were kept for uh, either a ritual purpose or for wearing on a particular occasion, such as birth or death. And many of them uh, came out only like on special occasions. So we have sarongs, we have palai, we have dodots, we have different names for the uh, hip wrappers and different names for the shoulder cloth textiles which are called uh, selendang and textiles which were used as backdrop. So they are known as ma or sarasas and they were used for hanging during rituals. And each one had a different format. So this is just an example to show how the borders and the uh, length of the textile would vary from those which are meant to be worn uh, and those which are meant to be uh, used as backdrop. So the dough dots, for example, would be almost squarish in shape, whereas the, uh, the sarongs, the sambagis, 
uh, would be in a more uh, long rectangular shapes. Um, here is a small uh, selection, but of course a very intense um, uh, view of the textiles, um, more from the perspective of uh, the um, iconography. And so here is where I want you to read the textiles as if you're looking at artifacts or artworks and uncover the significance uh, that is signified by these motifs. So we start with the first uh, most important one, which is very, very uh, um, well collected. I think most of the collections in uh, all over the world uh, have uh, this geese pattern textile. Uh, Tapi collection also has one. Um, and some of them have been carbon dated to 15th or even earlier. So this is the geese pattern and the antecedents for those geese pattern textiles again come from Jain miniatures, Jain Patli painting, as well as from um, Ajanta. Uh, another iconography that is very popular is also in the Saraswati Pat, and I, I brought this textile from the National Museum collection to highlight the fact that textile, I mean, uh, me, the, the figure of figurines in dancing poses were also used in Jain uh, Pata painting, and some of the pieces that you will see in the collection from the Roger Hollander collection in ACM, you will also find some of these motifs other than the geese. Um, of dancing ladies with chori, uh, holding a chori or holding a parrot uh, as a very important uh, marker of cultural motif that is uh, associated with Indian, um, Indian uh, art. This is another uh, very uniquely Southeast Asian motif uh, called the tumpal pattern, which is on the border of the textile. And this I found uh, used also at Adalaj Nivao and also at Modera. I don't know what the collection, connection could be and where the influence came from, but it's a very interesting juxtaposition to see some of the Indian sources for these textiles. The same way for the, um, the Sambagi from uh, Koromandal Coast found in Toraja, which also has the Tumpal pattern, which is quite similar to the uh, railing or the Jaroka in uh, Adalaj. Wow. This is another example of tumpal from the, uh, th uh, from the Thai textile that I just showed earlier. Um, and the tumpal continues in the Kain Lapas in Malay world as well, even today. So this is a contemporary 20th century uh, te textile with the same tumpal pattern. Another uh, iconography that I want to highlight and which we are very happy to, uh, to, to have in the collection, again, Tapi has a better piece than this in their collection, is of uh, dancers. They are engaged in Dandiya performance. So this is, again, a very interesting backdrop or what we call the Sarasa, uh, found from uh, uh, Indonesia. And this has been, again, carbon dated to 15th century that matches very closely with the Patas, the Jain Patas of 1475. Uh, dating. Uh, also, um, earlier piece, uh, a partly painting from the uh, uh, of uh, Kumut Chandra story from the JP Goenka collection, again having similar dancing uh, figures in a register or in a row. And of course, on Gujarat temple architecture, we find a lot of dance and music performances. And here, if you look carefully, we also have the similar uh, dancers and also a lady holding a parrot and a chori, like a chori bearer. And now you will see very quickly uh, similar examples in textile from Toraja. So here is again the same iconography, but what is very unique about this textile compared to the previous one, which was hand drawn uh, and um, hand painted, these are block printed and these are huge blocks. So this is the hugest wood block I have ever seen uh, on, uh, used on a textile. And this is, again, a carbon-dated uh, piece from the 15th century. Here you will see the giant uh, features of the projecting eye. And you also find a lot of these uh, tattoo marks. And the first time you see green being used. So you will see each alternate color of the sarong is in green, which is done using uh, um, haldi on um, indigo. So this is a fugitive color, but we are very uh, fortunate that this is still uh, well preserved. And again, the antecedent of this motif can be traced back to uh, um, Ajanta K26. 
Uh, later period, uh, block printed examples are also there in this collection from the 17th century. You can see the quality is falling uh, and this uh, iconography is so popular that it is still produced until today among the Tanato Raja people in Sulawesi. This is a 20th century uh, screen printed example, but they have not refrained from changing the motif. So you can see that uh, there is a visual as well as a ritual significance of these uh, so-called musicians or dancers or chori bearers in a very remote Indonesian uh, community. Another rare example is of these uh, warrior figures, what we call the dancing girls, uh, the warrior figures or uh, Vira Naikas. And again, there's a very un unusual uh, uh, combating figures. You see them with a yali as well, like a gaja, gaja vyala. Uh, again, a very traditional motif, must have come from uh, either Hindu or Jain iconography on the textiles. And we can see some antecedents from uh, similar uh, Surasundari figures on Gujarati uh, temples. Next, we move now to the Andhra coast. So this is a very rare, again, Ramayana uh, related scene from the Coromandel coast, which happens to be a very standard iconography in many museums uh, who have collected this textile, uh, possibly produced for, again, a Toraja community, which originally may have had some connection with Ramayana or significance of the Ramayana, but over the years, it has just become a static motif and it has been produced over and over again. Uh, I move to the Patola group, uh, which is a very rare collection. Uh, and also we are very fortunate that some of these textiles have been revived. So this, um, for information, this, there's a very beautiful paper by um, Shilpa Ben on this collection of uh, the um, uh, caparisoned elephants facing each other. So this is not a sari, obviously, it's a backdrop and it was used in Indonesia uh, mainly for the royal family, but also other tribal communities have also used it. Uh, this is uh, 18th century and it's in very good uh, condition. Uh, now we are looking at the double Ika examples. And again, the connection, stylistic connections that you will see from the collection of Roger Hollander. Where again, you see the Dandia pattern, the caparisoned elephant with two riders also having a strong uh, uh, inspiration from the uh, giant miniature painting. These are all heirloom textiles which have come from Indonesia. And more examples of animal patterns, which also you find in giant miniatures. Uh, these called, they are known as uh, kain patola. Kain means cloth in, uh, in Indonesian, in, in Bahasa. And we have these uh, three flower motif pattern which is very popular with the, uh, uh, with the royalty in, in, Jaka, in uh, Surakarta. And many of them would wear their pattern uh, trousers made out of uh, this particular full chap pattern, so the flower basket pattern. So this is a very interesting juxtaposition of a historical photograph from 1943 from the Leiden Museum collection. And we have several such uh, pajamas, which were made out of the um, patola material used by men uh, in the royal court, but also by dancers who would wrap them around uh, the waist as uh, waistbands. And this is the pattern which is very, very popular uh, in, in Javanese dance as well, Balinese and Javanese dance as well. And um, the, this patola pattern, or what's called the jalamprang uh, pattern, has become so popular with, uh, in, in Indonesia that many imitations of this uh, textile were, for, uh, were produced in Coromandel coast uh, with blocks possibly coming from Gujarat or maybe blocks produced in Coromandel coast. And there's a whole research that is waiting to be done on imitation patolas, uh, which can be as early as 19th century or as uh, late as uh, 20th, mid 20th century. So this is a quick collection of uh, the various block printed imitation patolas from the Hollander collection. And you can see the, the, the qualities vary 
uh, a lot, and some of them were also produced by the European mills because they found that these were popular, not the woolens that the Europeans were sending to Southeast Asia and to India. So they learned what was popular in Indonesia and started producing them in uh, the European mills. This is an example of how textile produced in uh, Java and Bali was actually used by them. Uh, these are not Indian imports. These are locally made textiles from uh, the textile village uh, that produce, the only village that produces double ikat in cotton in Indonesia is from Tenganan. And so this is the group of people from Tenganan wearing the, their locally produced double ikat. Uh, these are soldiers also wearing double ikat uh, sarongs. And this uh, one example that Ruth Barnes has brought to light is how the chabdi bhat or the jalam prang was actually adapted into weaving in Flores uh, in Indonesia, the Eastern Island of uh, Flores. So this is the Indonesian adaptation of our uh, Indian motif. Uh, yet another very rare example, uh, a very common example, but a rare piece in good shape, which is from the Ro Ho Hollander collection, is this four star square, which is known as um, grinsing. So this is a grinsing pattern that became very popular amongst um, Indonesians. Now this is a typical dodot. It is a squarish pattern, uh, squarish uh, uh, design um, format textile. And they used to be worn uh, over uh, trousers and jackets. And they were again uh, very much in demand by the royalty. And they came from um, Coromandel Coast. Now what is not clear is this is not a very Indian motif. So what was sent? Uh, as a model for the Indian uh, painters to, uh, I mean, or, or the painted textile producers to follow or to imitate. And what led to this uh, so-called uh, design, uh, it's something uh, not uh, answered by the scholars yet, and it's, it's, a, it's a mystery. But Tenganan produces these, these are very, very narrow and long bands, whereas the dodot is a huge uh, two meter by three meter textile. So the scale is very different. Here is just an example of single ikat weaving uh, done in Flores. I want to show you how the strap loom works in Southeast Asia, unlike in India where we have the pit loom and we have a much wider um, width. So Indonesian textiles are very narrow, so usually they are uh, joined at the salvage to make it wider. But usually uh, the looms are used by women, unlike in India where mostly men work on the looms. So this is a very interesting um, variation in the cultural pattern and habit of uh, evolving textile in Indonesia. I have a few examples, I will end here, um, of um, tumpa, uh, uh, um, uh, a textile from Coromandel Coast found in southern Sumatra. Now, uh, Lampung is another area which is very popular for uh, Coromandel Coast textiles. And this is a tambal motif. So it's actually a patchwork motif. So you can see many, many textiles. It's like a sample book. But it has become so popular that people have actually started collecting them. Uh, and they are also treated as heirloom textiles. But each and every uh, triangle is a different textile pattern. And this had a great market in Japan and in Indonesia. So uh, this is yet another uh, high quality example from this collection, which uh, I recently came across is also in the collection of the Parpias in um, uh, Cornell. They have just uh, completed an exhibition and published a book. So uh, I was quite pleasantly surprised to see examples of this uh, type uh, dodots in their collection as well. Um, I think one, one also needs to mention the importance of Kalamkari, uh, as these textiles being the precursors of Kalamkari in Coromandel Coast, because they are very intricately pa uh, painted uh, using resist. And much of the painting, as you can see, it's so intricate that it would not have been uh, put inside the dye, dye bath. So most of the dyes have actually been applied using um, modern and the dye in, in application form rather than in immersing the textile in uh, the dye one. 
I end with this uh, group of uh, textiles, which are actually the, um, uh, the um, tree of life motif. And the three of them are actually of very, very different qualities, as you can see. This is for the Sumatran market. This is for the European market. And this group is for the uh, Sri Lankan market. And there's a whole va variation in style. There are very good examples in the Tapi collection. And some of them are also embroidered. So what um, comes to my mind is that some of these textiles that are painted were actually imitations of original embroideries. And because they were fast produced using kalam and uh, dye, they began to be produced as textiles for, um, uh, uh, for a quick circulation in the market. And embroideries would uh, typically take much longer to produce. So they are fine, but they are not as fine as embroideries in comparison. Um, there are other textiles which I wanted to highlight, but I think I will just show them to you and go back to the last slide, which is about the um, use of Indian trade textiles in rituals. And this is one example that has been highly uh, spoken about and documented by many Indonesian textile scholars, uh, starting with Heti, Nui Palm, and also um, uh, uh, Ruth Barnes and uh, I think Matibel Gittinger also knows about this material when she published her book, Master Diaries of the World. And as recently as uh, Roxana Watterson in the National University of Singapore. Uh, so as you can see, these are the textiles which are called the sarasas uh, or also known as sarita. So the sarasas are Indian heirloom textiles and the saritas are produced locally by the Raja people, and they would carry them hung on these bamboos uh, into processions and decorate their uh, family home, which is known as the Tonkanan. And um, part of the death ceremony also involves sacrificing buffaloes. And typically, the textile that I just showed earlier would be something that would be draped on the buffalo that is to be sacrificed. So these are considered highly uh, significant and uh, uh, um, highly sacred textiles. Uh, many of them actually still continue to be used in 21st century. And you can see locally produced screen printed textiles also imitating the Gujarati textiles that reached Toraja as uh, early as uh, 13th century. So even today, the same textile pattern is being uh, reproduced uh, using uh, screen printing technology. Uh, and I, I end with this slide uh, where, where I want to just highlight the fact that um, although the Coromandel and the Gujarat coasts are producing, uh, are continuously producing uh, and introducing new fabrics, almost as many as 30, 40 different types of textiles, uh, each one has a story to tell and each one has a purpose and meaning in the community or the society that um, acquired it and preserved it. What is unfathomable and also disturbing in a sense is to understand its production because with no uh, written records or oral records, all we have today is the existing uh, tradition of hand loom and hand weaving and hand printing and, hand, and natural dyeing that is uh, fast disappearing uh, because of all the commercial reasons. But it's very important for us to preserve whatever is left of these glorious textiles that were produced in India in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I had to rush because I thought I'll give some more time for Q&A. Well, yes, exactly. So if there are any questions or comments, please feel free to ask. Thanks for a wonderful lecture. Just wanted to ask you, uh, the, you mentioned that the ACM are producing a catalog yeah. of uh, research and uh, uh, carbon dating. 
but that includes the current collection is it or uh, only the hollander collection hollander collection because the book is about the hollander collection okay, okay. and a few other donations they have received in the last 10 years okay but the focus will very much be the hollander okay collection. lovely yeah thank you There are no other any other comments or questions? Uh, you talked about the need to preserve these things. There is also a problem of uh, securing the financial future of these artists. Oh yes. And I think that is a issue that needs to be done. You know, apart from the art history and the archaeological or uh, technological conservation. there's also the need to sort of make people aware about what they need to consume in in this whole business of mass manufacture and i think that requires a greater sort of uh, cross connecting in society yeah. yeah apart from the art history part of it have have you have any experience of this successful conservation of i think kalamkari is doing very well of late uh patan patolas are pretty well supported by the affluent community i do see a lot lot more people wearing patolas whether it is single ikat which is from rajkot or from uh patan um what is what is disturbing is the quality the standards are falling uh and even though uh masuli patnam or uh, andhra is producing lot of um, block printed textiles the quality is very very shabby or even sanganer for example rajko um rajasthan we have a lot of uh, industry uh, support for indian hand made textiles but it's the quality and everyone wants quick results so the production of uh, uh using natural dye is really not there once uh, the time and to the cost and three the quality i have i have yet to see high quality indigo dyeing which is fast okay so i think we have challenges but i do feel that uh, the designers today uh, are really taking interest in our tra traditional textiles but of course not this this is another another level, level altogether of course yeah but i think whatever is happening is good but not good enough okay. and i think it's a little too late oh this uh, are you aware of the kind of uh, nurturing that paramparik has been doing with you know artist mm -hmm. families and their yeah, yeah, yeah. next generation and actually uh, government is doing a lot already but um there are also schools that are open to teach every, like i went to see naranjan's family and his he's got students from all over so he's open to teach everyone he goes to give workshops from london to singapore to new york everywhere so there's a lot of interest in trying to learn from beyond the parampara uh, and and to teach and spread as much as possible i have his father's work you know with He's done these village scenes and worship of the Devi and all. Absolutely stunning work. I don't think. Uh, oh, Naranjan from yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Sri Kalahasti. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Because he was the one picked up by Kamla, Kamla Devi. Yes, yes. So I have some pieces of his which he had done, but the uh, younger people are not able to do. Well, and the other thing which we discovered, which uh, also Shilpa Ben has helped to revive. the uh the textile weavers in pattern uh they were actually given museum pieces and they were told that now you go and reconstruct these uh, in order for them to revive their own heirloom tradition so even the weavers themselves don't know this existed in their own family 100 years ago so it's a good way to reintroduce museum pieces back to these uh, uh paramparik families Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Gauri. 
Um, such wonderful images and examples and such uh, exquisite pieces, actually. So we're quite fortunate to see them. Uh, I just have a quick announcement to make. Next Friday, which is the 26th uh, of July, in this very auditorium, there's a program called Badarwa Barasni Kwai, which is something that the museum does every year uh, in the monsoons. And this time, it's uh, the classical singer Rahul Deshpande who will be singing uh, here. So please come back. It's, it's open for everybody to attend. It will be at 6 p.m. next Friday. Thank you.